the leads are weak. The leads are weak. You're weak. Can't we all just get along? We're talking about sales marketing alignment. So stick around for today's episode of This Week in Sales. Hello and welcome to This Week in Sales. I'm Kevin Gaither, the CEO and founder of Inside Sales Recruiting. You know, you may recall our goal here is to help sales professionals improve their performance by giving them tips and tactics that they can take back today to improve their performance right now. Today's guest is Bill Bench, the Senior Vice President of Sales for Marketo, a B2B marketing automation company. Bill, welcome to the show. Kevin, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Bill, what's your nightmare sales job? I don't know about a nightmare job. I'll share one idea with you, though, that I had. When I was about 16, I, uh, I actually got a job in a tanning salon. <laughs> and the funny thing was, is I went and I told my dad that I was doing this. And he goes, tanning salon? Why would you go to a tanning salon? Only women go there. And then the light bulb went off. And Dad said, "I get it now, son. I get it." So uh, I don't know if it was a nightmare, but I did teach. I did learn a little bit about uh, about dealing with people, and to be 16 years old and having to be responsible for customer service. That was a learning process. To all of a sudden not blurt out what I was thinking, but actually have to respond to what they were thinking. So that was a good intro to sales, and and more importantly, after that, I went to go work for. Um, some pretty difficult managers, which not while being a nightmare scenario, those were situations that taught me well. Well, good, good. Well, I think you can uh, take that knowledge today and uh, impart it to our, uh, in, uh, in our audience. And I think it's about time for me to properly introduce you. What do we say? Sounds good. So uh, Bill is the Senior Vice President of Sales for Marketo, as introduced before. He leads Marketo's sales and customer success act- activities and is a key architect of Marketo's rapid sales growth. Marketo has actually seen nearly 1,500% uh, growth in revenue over the last three years to $14.3 million in 2010 to take the number one spot in uh, on the list of fastest growing Silicon Valley private companies. That's awesome. And uh, prior to Marketo, Bill held leadership roles at Avalent, BEA, PeopleSoft, and Oracle with extensive experience in direct, inside, and channel sales models. Welcome to the show. Sounds good. I'm looking forward to it. Good. So let's just dive right in. We're talking about sales marketing uh, alignment. What does that really mean to you, Bill? I think when you talk to a lot of people, everybody wants to have sales and marketing alignment, and they use a lot of big round words about communication and alignment and sharing of ideas. But to me, it really comes down to a couple of key things. I think it comes down to definitions and metrics, Kevin. Well, good. So let's let's talk about some of those uh, those definitions. You just used that big broad phrase. I'm going to ha- uh, pound you a little bit here. We got to get deeper here for our audience here. What sort of definitions should we get clear on, and what sort of metrics should we be tracking that tells us if we do or do not have good sales marketing alignment? Yeah, starting on the definitional side, the first thing you want to think about is your standard funnel, you know, from the top of the funnel down to the narrow point at the bottom. And every company has their own names, but I'll just throw out some common ones that people have that run through the funnel. Suspects become prospects, prospects become leads, leads become opportunities, and opportunities become sales. If you look at those, those defi- those each should have a definition attached to them. Everybody knows what a closed sale is, right? I have a piece of paper in front of me with the customer's signature. That part's pretty easy. At that part, working back up, that's when it gets a lot more blurry and a lot more difficult. And I would guess that if you went to most B2B companies and asked the head of sales in one room and the head of marketing in another room separately, hey, what is the definition of a suspect, of a prospect, of a lead? I'll bet you you would get a different answer from those folks, 90% of the cases. And that's where the big round words are all used, but that the true definitions haven't been agreed upon. And so that's the first thing I think you need to think about when you start talking about sales and marketing alignment is you need to have the sale, the head of sales and the head of marketing in the same room 
nodding their heads to what the definition of those different those different stages are. And once you get that, that's I think the starting point to launch on true marketing alignment. Mm, okay, good, good. I, I, I think you're 100% right. And one of the best things that we did at business.com several years ago was getting clear, strangely enough, this was a long time ago, what did a closed deal mean? And the reason we had problems in that regard where a salesperson thought that collecting the insertion order meant that that was a closed deal and it wasn't live on the site and it wasn't generating revenue. So there was a salesperson that would have a pile of insertion orders but it wasn't generating revenue because we didn't have a common definition, not only at the top level, but also on the individual contributor level. Uh, level. So I, I couldn't agree, uh, agree more there. Um, another thing that we did at business.com was to, with sales and marketing, the marketing leader got us in a room, got the top salespeople and the directors and the VP of sales in the room and said, if you guys were to create your own leads, what would those leads look like? And through that conversation, it became uh, very, we we came up with like the marketing qualified lead, you know, what it meant for, for the marketing qualified lead, uh, you know, from there. And that was a, a, a real eye-opening uh, situation for us because marketing knew what we were looking for, at at least at that point in time. <laughs> well, I, I think that's exactly right. And you know, use the term marketing qualified lead, which is I think a more granular level below the suspects to prospects to leads. You know, you get the marketing qualified lead, sales accepted leads, different stages like that that are subcategories. That also implies a certain level of sophistication that I think that you have if you're using those types of terms. And that means that you're probably further along on the, the experience or the, the sophistication curve of marketing and sales alignment. I, I tend to start at that top of that funnel and I tend to start on January 1st of a, of a new year or whatever the first day of someone's new fiscal year is. And I think at that point, there should be that tied off communication that the definitions of what the terms will be and what they mean. Um, I think the, the next thing that the, that the people need to have is the, um, the aside from the, the definitions tied off, is they need to have an agreement of what their expectation is that sales is going to generate for the year, as well as marketing. And I think the best run organizations I've seen have some discussion around that, that there is a uh, an accountability that marketing has via a percentage. Maybe you're supposed to drive 60% of the leads and versus sales, you're supposed to drive 40%. So that's the, the second step. And that, that kind of leads me into the piece about the metrics. So there's the definitions, mm -hmm. first having the agreement. That to me is the natural place to start to drive sales and marketing alignment. The second, the second place is the metrics. If you want to explore that, I'm happy to share some ideas around that. I would. Let's, let's just talk about the top three. I mean, if you were going to start at a new company tomorrow, Bill, um, or, or step into a, to a you know, consulting opportunity, what, what would be the three metrics you'd say, without these three, we don't do anything as it relates to sales and marketing alignment? The first three are actually fairly sales focused things. I'd need to walk in and understand what's the average sales cycle, mm -hmm. what's the average sale price, and then I'd probably want to understand what kind of quotas do the reps carry so I can start determining is this an enterprise type of cycle that, hey, the reps carry a million dollar quota and the average sales cycle is nine months and the average sales deal is 500K. That tells me that reps are probably only going to do a couple deals a year versus if someone tells me that they've got that same million dollar quota but they've got an average sales cycle of 15 days and the average sale price is 5K, I can quickly do the math, start determining how that, that sales machine needs to have lead flow being fed, which ties me back to the marketing and sales alignment. At that point, the two key things that I'd really look at over on the marketing side, or I shouldn't say two things, I'd probably look at three things. I'd look at, at the highest level, how many, how many names do we generate, right? Whatever that is called inside your organization, a suspect, a prospect. How many names do we generate? Trade shows, pan banner ads, you know, advertisements, radio, whatever your sources of your marketing mix are for generating business. I want to know how many, how many uh, names do we generate on a monthly, quarterly, whatever the key time frame is I need to see. Second thing I'd look at from there is how many of those sift down into what our definition of an opportunity is. And that to me is the most absolute important thing in running the, the handoff between sales and marketing because that's typically where marketing 
hands the baton over to sales and sales picks it up and runs with it is where the opportunity is created. Somewhere around that area, give or take, is where the, the handoff happens. And as they say, you know, accidents happen in the intersections. And so that's the area that you probably need to focus most of your time on. So uh, the total number of needs, the total number of opportunities, and then the deals, the closed deals, back to what you said from, from your past employer was, what is the definition of a, a closed deal? If I have those three things, the, the, the number of names or number of leads coming in, the ops, and then the closed deals, I can very quickly in my, my head do the, do the monkey math to determine what mm -hmm. kind of business this is and kind of yeah. think about how marketing should interact with sales. Right. No, I love that. I mean, you, you sort of, you're thinking about it in, in with, it, with this real pipeline view of, let's say there's 10,000 uh, suspects created, and of those 10,000 suspects, there's a certain percentage of those that are going to turn into uh, qualified opportunities, and then a certain percentage of those that are going to turn into the conversion into the actual deals. And then, like you said, you're using the monkey math. Never heard that phrase before. I love it. Uh, but you're also then going to apply those sales uh, sales metrics of your average sales price and uh, and, and your deal closing ratios, I'd imagine that'd be on there too, opportunity closing ratios to really get, get some predictable revenue out of this, yeah? That's exactly right. You know, you asked a really good question in that. You said, if I started tomorrow at a place, what would I look at? You know, the other thing that I'd, I'd encourage you to think about, if you started brand new at a place and you could build the sales process, the sales and marketing process from scratch, I'll bet you, if you really think hard about it, you'd come up with something like this. You'd think about it from the sales perspective that what do you want your salespeople to do? I want them to sell. I don't want them to prospect. I don't want them to be doing collections on the back end. I want them doing that middle part, which most sales folks would kind of define as the qualification and discovery stage to the negotiation and close, right? Most sales reps that I meet, you know, I mean, I, I do a lot of interviews in this office and folks come in and I say, hey, tell me a little bit about your skill set. Tell me a little bit about your sales DNA. What are you great at? And they'll be like, oh boy, Bill, I can segment and parse a territory better than anybody's business. I can, before I ever jump on the phone or do an email, look at how to break down a territory by industry, by size, by vertical, by whatever. I go, wow, that sounds great. And then the next step is I am great at jumping on the phones and prospecting, sending emails, veto letters, smoke signals, whatever it takes. I go, wow, it sounds great. And then they say, and then qualification. Once I get them on the phone, I am perfect at qualifying, understanding, deep dive level discovery stuff. Wow, you sound like a wonderful sales rep. I am, Bill, but it gets better. And then they say, then I go and put the whole deal structure together of the strategy for demos, for competitive, for partners, for pricing, all these different components. I weave them together. I pull the team and resources together and I put them on the ground. I have to hire you right now. They go, no, wait, wait, let me finish. I can negotiate as good as an attorney and I can close better than anybody in the world out there. And you go, wow, is that it? And they go, no, account management. And they tell you this story about how great they are on this incredibly long, wide sales cycle. And you think no one can really be this good. And it's true. There are sales reps that are really, really capable at all mm -hmm. those things. But as I find most sales reps, what they like to do, as well as what they're really good at, is the qualified to close the process. So if you're starting... Uh, a brand new sales organization or landing on the ground day one and you have your chance to build it the way you want, you'd ideally probably build it so that your sales team is fed leads. Now, I'm not saying deals that are ready to close. I'm saying deals that are ready to engage in the sales cycle, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what sales reps are great, that discovery through that selling piece to the close and then cut them loose at that point, maybe go to a customer success thing. That would be if you were absolutely being as selfish and selfish as you could could be about building a sales model, you'd say, I want a bunch of sales killers that can come in and build this type of this type of setup. Right. We had Aaron Ross on the show about three weeks ago, and he talked about segmenting uh, segmenting your sales team in actually uh, four different uh, four different breeds, if you will. Um, one was the the outbound calling lead gen reps, you know, the SDRs, right? Then he also then suggested the inbound reps, those just ha handling the inbound leads, and then he referred to the uh, account executives. For our our purposes, we'll call those the close. Users. You know, the qualified deals, they're working through to the close. And then the account managers or the customer success uh, managers that are, you know, post-sale. Because you're right. You and I have seen the salespeople that actually can do all of that. But they're rare, right? Very. Very rare. Very. So getting into that, that level of specialization. But let me push back on you for a second. 
a lot of our viewers and our the, the people that are you know looking at, at at our show today don't have the benefit of a 10 person sales team that they can separate there. So if the resources are limited, what would be your your thoughts there on you know where where do you where do you specialize, where do you not specialize? Yeah, I mean, in an ideal scenario, the four that Aaron described to you, I think are right on because it also builds you that that feeder supply chain of reps, right? Your maybe your inbound folks become your outbound once they get a little more senior. Your, they graduate to be the AEs, and you know the AEs maybe go to be outside reps or whatever that type of thing. So that type of model does work if you have the benefit of having some scale and having the uh, the budget to be able to build that type of model. If not otherwise, then I think what you're going to do is you're going to fall back to a scenario where a sales rep carries a much bigger load of the of that wide that wide berth. And from that perspective, I think what I would tend to do is I would try to focus new business from install and customer business. That would be the first cut because you're right. While sales reps don't love segmenting their territories and doing prospecting. Most people have done it, and so most people have some skills on it, and it's also something that, that most people are expected to do. Whether you're in an organization that, that feeds you leads or not, most people do have an expectation that they're going to, that they're going to uh, have to do have to eat what they kill, so to speak. So my first cut is if you had limited number of people, I would try to divide new versus install based selling because install base poses a whole different set of challenges, a whole different type of relationship that you have with your organization. So focus customer success separate than than going and, and hunting the new logo. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the hunters let them hunt. The farmers let them, you know, the lovers let them love, you know, yeah. absolutely. I think the phrase I've heard, uh, uh, like for Salesforce, they use a, a land and expand, uh, you know, phrase where the hunter just brings on maybe a, a minimum viable type of uh, type of deal. And then it's all on the all on the account managers to to upgrade uh, through the products and then expand the, the, the usage from there, which now is becoming fairly common in all SaaS based models, right? It is, you know, if you think of SaaS-based models, the oldest one is probably, you know, Salesforce that you think about, and you know what they're twelve years old. So, from that perspective, most of the business that SaaS models are selling today is new focused, and so it makes a lot of sense for that model. But when you get into products, maybe some of the old perpetual on-premise types of things, those models, a lot of times, those companies have sixty, seventy percent of their their bookings or their revenue come from their install base. And so from that perspective, you might have to look at it a little bit differently. But yeah, I agree in a SaaS world, it does tend to make a lot of sense about having uh, having the hunters hunt. Good, good. All right, let's talk about sales playbooks. I always use a uh, football analogies when I'm uh, when I'm talking about uh, onboarding sales reps, training sales reps, and coaching sales reps, and how unbelievable it would be if you had a football team out there like I don't know the Dallas Cowboys, for example, that that got out on the field and decided eh, just get open. I don't know, just get open and, and, and run around and see if you can you can break free. That would be absolutely unbelievable. I mean, I'm sure Dallas does that on a regular basis though, right, Bill? I, uh, they sure didn't do it yesterday, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so talk to me about what your viewpoint is of, uh, of playbooks. What are the essential components? Why, why should we even have playbooks in the first place? Well, yeah. So that's the first part. Is is let's create the the problem of what not having one is. I think the problem goes back to having a one size fits all methodology. And and personally, me coming through a lot of larger organizations in my early stages of my career, those were really good to go through. But as you find, you know, a Cisco sells thousands of products to hundreds of different types of buyers. And so to say that we have one methodology just as an antiquated kind of old view. So that's the problem statement, right? Because we know that buyers are buying differently today. They're much more educated when they get to you because of the web, because of, of data sources that they can go and learn about where uh, about your product and things like that. And so from that perspective, you need to react to buyers in what I consider to be a much more situational environment. So to apply it back to your, your, uh, your analogy that you did, you got to read the play that's setting up on the field and be able to react, react up to it right away. And so from that perspective, I think the first part of a playbook that's essential is understanding who and how your, who your buyer is and how they buy. 
And so I'll give you an example for us internally here is Marketo really segments our buyers into three general categories, small businesses, companies under 100 employees, then medium businesses, 100 to 1,500, and then enterprise businesses, which is uh, companies above 1,500. Now, on top of that, you can add verticals, you could add industries, you could even add things like product specialty and stuff like that. But let's just keep it simple at something like that, the three categories. Well, I know that the competitors on my low end that sell to those smaller companies are different than the ones that sell to my high end. And so to say that I'm gonna have the same sales rep run a single methodology across those two different types of environment just because they happen to own Ohio as a piece of dirt doesn't make sense. I don't think that holds up in today's world where, like I said, you have a much more educated buyer. And so they're looking for, quite honestly, a much better experience from their salesperson. If you have an environment where you don't have self-service selling, but where someone's coming to you and needs to speak with you to gain value out of the cycle, then I think they want you to be educated and really specific to what their their issues and what their problems are. And so that means selling to a company of that size could be a perfect example. Selling against certain competitors, selling to, like I said, a specific industry, being able to understand the business model. Those are really important things, I think, that give credence for having a sales playbook in place. So you talked about, and this is awesome stuff here, right? I mean, the first words out of your mouth was, you need to understand who the buyer is and, and how they like to, to buy stuff, whether it be your stuff or other stuff, right? Right. How am I gonna, if, again, if I started a new company that sells you know, the latest 2.0 widget, how do I go about actually doing that from a tactical perspective? I think if you're a new company, my advice when I talk to smaller companies is everybody has a business plan and on that business plan has a lot of the components we talked about before. We expect average sales cycles of this, average sale price of this. You multiply the number of deals you think you're going to sell and that's going to give you your bookings or your, your quota or whatever that your target is called. I really advocate that if you're a brand new young company starting up, don't worry about average sale price and average sales cycle. Worry about logos. Go out and get business because what's going to happen is if you give yourself one, two, or three months, you're going to go get some deals done. You're going to look back and you're going to see naturally what's settling in to be your average sales cycle and your average sale price. Once you have those, then you have some time to start understanding how your buyer is buying. Now, you got to say, if you're starting a company, it probably means that you have some experience in that kind of product or that kind of market that you're selling to. So you're probably gonna have some input, you're probably gonna have some people that have the DNA of whatever you sell inside that company and are bringing some past history. So you're gonna have some ideas, but I, I do think from starting up, focus on transactions, don't focus on dollars, because dollars can mislead you, because the sales rep, if you're, really, if you're really bonusing them and paying them on a performance on a comp plan, and as we know, comp drives behavior, if a sales rep is comped on the bigger the deal, at an early stage of a company, maybe they hold on to something that they could have taken off the street instead of just getting the deal done and learning a little bit about the customer, going and getting them successful, and learning about how do they want to buy, how did they want to use your software, so that you can apply that that back to the question you just asked me, which is how do you learn? Right. And when you say how they how they like to, to buy, I mean, the obvious question is not going to be, so tell me how you like to buy stuff, or or is it? I mean, what what what's a better way of really? Let's say you have a basket of, you know, several dozen customers, and you really want to get a sense for how they buy stuff. You're not going to just go, well, how do you like to buy stuff? What are better questions to be asking there? I tend to uh, I've seen this at a few companies. I tend to look at what you do as a company. And most people correlate, you know, the feature functions of what you do into some type of business benefit. All right. And most people boil those 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 feature functions down to three, four, or five key feature benefits that you're gonna get. You know, kind of the why Marketo question. Like mm -hmm. why am I gonna buy a Marketo? Yeah. I, I, I better have at the tip of my tongue two or three things that I can really rattle off that are gonna really apply to um, my to, to the buyer. Well, the way I like to do it is actually, you know, the old saying, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, tell you what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you again. I kind of like to do the same thing in that environment where with a, a prospect, the scenario, the best case I would say is, you know, listen, Kevin, uh, you obviously have interest in my product. You reached out on my website or stopped by my trade show booth or, you know, whatever, however I got your name and your source. Uh, let's go through this conversation and listen, by the way, let me tell you what I'm going to do. Marketo as a company really helps our customers do two or three things, and these are those two or three things. 
I'm going to be listening for those cues in what you tell me about your business. And you know what I'm going to do is after we're done, I'm going to feed back to how I think my product or my company can have an impact on your business. And from that point, if we move forward in the cycle, I'm going to build my entire business plan and my, my total justification plan for you guys to buy my product around kind of the top two or three things that you tell me that seem to be the biggest problems that you have. And so it's a, probably a more elegant or nicer way than saying, hey, tell me how your company likes to buy. I mean, you, you're going to get yeah. to the specifics of how you guys do legal and procurement and sign contracts and like that. But realistically, learning how someone likes to buy doesn't have to be this awkward conversation of, hey, tell me how you guys evaluate software. Have you ever bought software? Have you done it in your role at this company? That type of thing. It can be a little more elegant than that, uh, where you're going out and saying, listen, my company helps other companies like you do these things. Tell me your business problems so I can apply those things back to you. And that's going to help us probably come to ground on building a business case. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what else? What are some of the other essential components of a, of, a, of a playbook? Is it just scripts, man? I mean, are we just talking, just stick a bunch of scripts in there and, and away we go? What else is in there? I actually don't think it's scripts. I think scripts typically are something that are used by earlier stage sales reps because they don't have the history of thinking as quickly on their feet and being as fast to react. You know, think about again back to your football analogy. If you have a uh, you know a third string quarterback out there, how well does he know the plays? Well, he's probably practiced them in scrimmages and stuff like that. But out in the true battlefield, probably hasn't practiced them that much. So the more guidance or scripts that you can give them, probably good. But as someone gets their sea legs about them and gets some skill set, I think it has to be more of a, you know an idea or an outline type of format as far as what a playbook is. I think it's kind of like if you see this play setting up then here are a couple of options of how you can react, pick one. And, uh, and, and you can build those from a lot of things. You can build it by you know, who the role of who you're talking to inside of an organization. You can do it based on who you've, uh, who you've qualified or the competitors in the, in the, inside the deal competing against you. There's a number of, of different uh, items that you can measure up against and say, this is how I'm going to build my playbook. But I think the idea is to go and transfer ideas as opposed to a specific script or, you know, bulletized type of, you know, line item list. It sounds like what you're telling me is a lot, a lot about how to handle objections. Is there, is that it? Is that all that's in, in playbooks? No, no, no. I see um, playbooks are a way to try and lead the cycle is, you know, you, people talk about things like, planning landmines for your competitors and also, you know, avoiding the traps that they set for you. Well, if, if you talk to any, any salesperson, right, and they've been offered a chance to go do demos and they know it's a competitive environment, you know, there's this debate on, do you want to go first? Do you want to go last? Where do you want to go? All right. Well, I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is. It depends on kind of what your storyline is and are you better closing? Are you better after the customer's been educated a little bit on coming and capping it off? Are you great at educating the customer and getting their buy-in from there? So it's, it's hard to say on that, but um, I, uh, I don't think it's just for, I don't think it's, I don't think it's simply just for the, um, the overcoming objections. I think it's also a little bit about, about having to lead the sales cycle. Perfect. F uh, one final thing about playbooks. Are your playbooks in paper-based form or are they sitting in your CRM application of choice? They are in, um, they're, uh, they're in paper-based form and they're a little bit tribal as well. Um, I, you can't see the floor behind me here, but um, the Marketo floor, we have the open type of floor plan where we don't have cubes and we don't have walls. So information flow is rapid. It's super fast. If the sales reps hear something, they can talk about it on the floor and other people who aren't on the phone can pop up and listen. Uh, and so it's, it's a very open floor plan, which is really helpful for transferring that type of knowledge. That also is very helpful for training people and letting other people hear the more experienced reps. So when we have new hires come in, we tend to reshuffle our seating pretty often so that we put new hires closer to the more senior reps so that they can learn through osmosis. So that's number one. Then number two, we do have playbooks that we keep. Uh, we do upload them and put them in chatter, but I think that most of the people where they use the playbooks typically is, like I said, when they're newer inside the organization mm -hmm. and they're trying to learn our value proposition and our story. And so they're, they're picking it up there at the beginning. And then after a while, then they, you know, if they forget something, they might go to chatter and take a look at it there. 
Got it. Excellent. So, uh, Bill, finally, and that we'll wrap up here. You're the senior vice president of sales of one of the hottest, fastest growing startups in Silicon Valley. For all the sales professionals that are out there that aspire to uh, to your level of success, what few pieces of advice would you uh, would you give us? Well, since we've talked a little bit about sales reps and AEs today, I'll start at that level. Um, I I had the fortune of coming out of school and starting at some big companies that had very formalized training programs. So if you look at companies like ADP or like a a nation, uh, was it National Rent-A-Car, those are people that go through a very structured program. And I think if you're a young person coming out of school, getting your first early chops in the sales world, I do think that a disciplined sales approach is a great thing to get because if you learn that early in your career, you're going to take it with you. And and I'll tell you a couple key things that I learned that I, I still do to this day. They might seem a little bit trite, but they, they're real. Is before I wrap up any day, I write down the first five things I'm going to do the next day. And normally what that is is on my list of to-dos from that current day. I probably didn't complete everything, so I'm pushing the things I didn't wrap up and I want to get those done and get moving on to my next things. So I always make a list of the first things. The other thing I do is I actually have a a priority order of how I attack things in the morning and it could be different uh, depending on kind of what I'm focused on. It could be today is a customer focused day, meaning people that are already my customers I want to go and focus on getting them to a a user summit. I want to focus on talking with 10 of them just to hear some feedback. It could be like that. It could be grouped into something like uh, channels. I want to focus on my channel relationships today. And so I do tend to not only make the, the, the very distinct itemized list of the things I'm going to do, but I try to group it by a task, which could be, like I said, customer or prospect facing or marketing interaction or channels or something like that. So those are a couple of things. Um, the other thing that, that I, I think that is um, that I'd share is I have a sales rep here on our team named Kevin, and this is his second sales job. His first one was at a small company, really no sales training, no structure, no playbooks, nothing like that. And so he's coming here and he's kind of worked his way up through the process that I described earlier. Started off as a, an SDR, kind of an inbound qualifier, moved over to the sales approach. And, um, and we went to a uh, conference together and he was talking to me about how great it was to travel and I was helping him like to little things like here's how you pack a suit jacket, you know, so it doesn't wrinkle, you know, the most basic things that, you know, you forget, but someone taught you at some point. And so it was really fun being on the road. And he said, you know, Bill, it's really cool. I, you know, I, I'm so jealous. I wish I could be in the boardroom with you when you have the board meetings going on. And, you know, the reality is, it's like, I think back to when I was in his role and I thought the exact same thing is like, hey, I'm in this job now, but I want to be in that job. And when I got to that job, I wanted to be in the next one. And you know what? there is a certain fun aspect. It's neat to be inside of a boardroom at a company like mine where we're helping planning the strategy, helping plan the strategy and the future direction. But there's also a lot of work that goes with it. And so my, my kind of key finishing point on that is uh, I told Kevin is, hey, just whatever you do, make it last where you are. Because I was always in a rush to get to my next step. And once I got there, I just wanted the next one. And so I don't think I enjoyed it as much as I could have. And, uh, you know, Kevin, I'm sure you know what it's like. You know, you go off to New York City for a conference and you're thinking, New York City, this is great. Well, what happens? You land probably at midnight. You get in a car, go to your hotel, get up super early. You go into a conference room from 8 a.m. till 6 p.m., go off to some dinner till 9, 10 o'clock, and then you go back to your hotel room. Meanwhile, you, it wouldn't have mattered if you were in New York City or Ottawa or wherever. You know, The fact is that you were just in some space. And so that's one of those things that I try to always make some time and say, take a deep breath and appreciate and make you know, what I have going right now last a little bit. That's sage advice. I love it. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. That's all we have for today. Bill Bench, wonderful having you on the show. Thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate you asking me, Kevin. Very good. So uh, if you have any sales questions or a sales topic that you'd like to present to us for next week, we've gotten a lot of feedback over the last 
several weeks, um, you can feel free to email me at askkevin at thisweekin.com or tweet at us at salesweek. Of course, you can like our Facebook page, This Week in Sales, or go to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash show forward slash This Week in Sales. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Stay tuned for our show next week where I have Dr. Chris Croner on, author of Never Hire a Bad Salesperson Again. And wouldn't we all like to (laughs) never hire a bad salesperson again? Thanks for joining us this week. Have a great day.